Hey John here. Let's look at bee trees, what they are and how they work. Now the definition of a bee tree may vary a little bit depending on who you talk to. There's certain ways to optimize a bee tree dependent on the nature of your application. All right. So we're going to talk in very general terms here, the overall theory of how this thing sort of fits together. So we're going to define a bee tree or specifically an order M bee tree as being a type of search tree such that each of the interior nodes in the tree can have M children or up to M children. The values of the data are going to only be stored in the leaves of the tree while the interior nodes only contain keys. Now, to paraphrase Wikipedia, while quoting Knuth, who's a, if you don't know that name, it's a big publisher in the field of computer science, been actively publishing for 60 years, he defines a B tree as an order M tree which satisfies the following properties. Okay, and I'm going to paraphrase uh, Wikipedia here. Every node has at most M children, where M is defined as the order of the tree. Each non-leaf node and non-root node has at least M over 2 child nodes. And when we calculate that, we round up. Okay, so we're going to look at an example that has a order 5 tree in a minute. And it will have always at least three child nodes for each one of the non-leaf and non-root nodes. The root node has to have at least two children if it's not a leaf node. If it is a leaf node, it could have just one. Okay, rule number four. A non-leaf node with K children will always have K minus one keys. Okay, we'll see how that works in a minute as well. All leaves in the tree will always appear on the, in, in the same level. All right? Now, I threw a footnote in here because in Wikipedia, they say something that just doesn't make any sense to me. They say that the uh, leaves all appear in the sa same level, and they carry no information. Uh, that doesn't really make sense to me. Um so I left this out, okay? And I've Googled around a little bit and looked at some other publications, and they tend to not say this either. But this might actually have to do with how you consider the notion of a leaf. You know, like a red-black tree has leaves that are not in the tree. And, you know, you think of them, they're there, but they're always some null concept that don't really exist, okay? So you think about these one way or another, okay? I think about the leaves as the elements in the tree that hold the actual values, okay? And I'm certainly not alone. So this discussion will be based on this definition of what a leaf is. And here's a picture of one so we can all get on the same base and understand what I'm talking about here, okay? So this is an order 5B tree, okay? It's an order 5, therefore that means here's a node, this is the root node, and it has 1, 2, three, four, five links in it that could point to children nodes, all right? This node has three children, okay? Two of them are not used. These X's I put in here to mark where there would be a null pointer. And the dashes in here represent an empty key value. So the way this works is here's your K children out of your order five total possible children, right? You have K in this example equals three. And therefore, the node will have K minus one, which is two keys. So you see these two values here are the values of the keys of nodes in the children, all right? And the way these keys work is they represent... In this case here, this key here represents the smallest key value that exists in the leaves in the subtree pointed to by this pointer right here. So, for example, this 10 does appear down here. It's the smallest key out of all the children 
out of all the subtree nodes here that are linked to out of this root right here. So it says if you look down there, you'll find all the keys that are greater than or equal to 10. Same thing's true about this key over here. If you follow this pointer down here, all the keys must be greater than or equal to 40. So when you look at these together, what do you know? If you know that all keys greater than or equal to 10 are in this subtree here, without looking over here, you can know that all the keys in this subtree over there must be less than 10. Okay, and we look down here and that's true. All the keys down here are in fact less than 10 because all the keys here have to be greater than or equal to 10 and at the same time less than 40, we have a range of key values that'll be down here. And that's what you see down here, 10 through some number that's less than 40, okay? So the highest key down here in this leaf node is 19. Over here, we say all the children that you'll find over here have keys that are greater than or equal to 40 and that's what you see, you got a 40, 42 and so on up to 97. Now this is true recursively, so if you go down to this child here and you ask, okay, what are all the values of the leaf elements that could be linked to by this pointer? Well, they have to be explicitly less than 11 because anything that's greater than or equal to 11 and less than 14 must be here. Okay, and you see that's true. And over here, you have unused pointers, right? So we have at least half of them are filled in, right? Rounded up, so that means it has to have three children, and it does in this example. Therefore, anything greater than 14 has to be over here. And we know, because we came from up on top of the root node up here, they also have to be less than 40, okay? Now, I only drew a tree with two levels. I mean, they only got so much room on the screen here. Clearly, we can have as many levels deep as we want this tree to be, as long as it always meets all these rules, okay? At most, M. In this case, M is 5, and physically, they're just simply limited. There's only going to be that many child pointers in any given node, Okay. Every non-leaf node except for the root must have M over 2. And you see there's at least 3, there's at least 3, there's at least 3. It fits that rule. Rule has to have at least 2 children. Well, this root has 3, so that fits. Here must be, you know, K minus 1 keys given K child pointers. And that's easy to see in here because if there's any pointers in here, there's always a key between the two pointers that partitions all the elements that exist in each one of these children so you can figure out which child to go into when you're doing a search. And again, all the leaves are on the same level here. Now this is going to achieve order log n performance, okay? Turns out that the logarithm here would be, uh, the base of this logarithm would be the order of the tree. So roughly speaking, we'll be looking at log 5 of n, okay? And we know that it's constrained to a log n style complexity because if all the leaves must be on the same level, then the path from the root to any leaf is always exactly the same. Therefore, by definition, it must be balanced, okay? In fact, it's perfectly balanced. Therefore, you'll definitely achieve your log and performance. We already got trees. We already got other ways to store data. Why, why do we want to do yet another way of storing data in trees? Well, we point out here that if you have so much data it can't fit in memory, what are you going to do? You need to store it on disk. And if you store it on disk, it turns out that the time it takes to access the data can be several orders of magnitude slower than just interacting with the memory of your machine. Well, the idea is that we want to try and figure out how to build a tree so that the search doesn't have to require a lot of I.O. operations on the disk. Okay? The way we want to do that is visit as few number of nodes as possible. So what happens is, by increasing the number of children, 
that you know in, in any given node, it turns out the height of the tree becomes shorter. Now, granted, the width becomes wider, but that's okay. Think about that, right? The number of nodes that you need to visit during a search is on the order of the tree height. And the tree height is the log of the number of nodes, okay? Look at what's going on here. Look at all these, uh, the elements in here, all the keys in the bottom layer. We'll see more about this in a second. We got one, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. All these represent the keys of the elements that are stored in this tree. Unlike the binary tree, we don't really store the element values up in here. The element values would go down here. I'm only showing the keys down here because the element values would just be stored along with the keys. My point is, they're stored down here. And given this many elements, in a tree this size, it's very short. It's wide, but we don't care. Remember, all we need to do is look in the root node. Let's say we're looking for like number 16 here. What are we going to do? We have to look in the root node to figure out, well, should 16 be over here? Well, no, because it's greater than or equal to 10. Is it in here? Well, it's greater than or equal to 10, and it's less than 40. Therefore, yeah, it would be here. So we just looked at one node to answer that question. We then have to look at this node to figure out, is it less than 11? No. Is it greater than or equal to 11 and less than 14? No. Is it greater than 14 and less than infinity, right? Because there are no more in this node? And the answer is yes. So we go down here and then we look through all the elements that are in this leaf here and we find it right there. What have we done? We've accessed one, two nodes and one leaf. If each one of these things, right, if each node is stored in a different place on the disk and the leaf is stored in a different place on the disk, that's three things that we, three times we had to talk to the disk drive, okay? If this was a binary tree with all these elements and we traverse down the tree, it could have more, and it most likely will have uh, quite a few more levels to it before we get to the leaves, okay? Which would require us to do more disk operations, which would slow down the entire process. It would also probably be true that uh, any one of the nodes in a binary tree might be pretty small and not consume an entire disk sector which would then result in us either wasting the rest of the disk sector or trying to put multiple nodes in one disk sector. And that might work out fine and dandy, provided that the sizes kind of tessellate and, and fit in there correctly. Anyway, I digress. The bottom line is, if each node in this tree and each leaf in this tree can fit roughly into one block or one sector on the disk, you can minimize the amount of I.O. operations by increasing the order of this tree, okay? The bigger the order of the tree is, the wider it gets, but the height stays short. And it's the height of the tree that determines how many times you got to reach out to the disk. Now, obviously, if the order gets too big, it might be that one of these nodes no longer fits in one single disk block, all right? Now, disk blocks these days are on the order of 4K, 4096 bytes. So depending on the kind of data that you use to represent the keys of your elements, right? If it's, you know, long text strings, you don't get to fit so many in one disk block. But if they're just integers, you can fit quite a few of those in a disk block, all right? So again, this all gets into tuning and optimization. The whole point is that you use them in order to optimize by reducing as much as possible the number of times you need to reach out to a disk drive while performing a search function and walking down this tree, okay? And that is why we care about this, right? Because we want everything to go as quickly as possible. We don't want to waste time. So... Reduce the total number of times as much as possible that you need to reach out and interact with the disk. So how does searching work? Well, I actually kind of walked through that. The short of it is you do it just like you do a regular old binary search, right? By walking down the, uh, the keys in the tree, you just have more of them to deal with, all right? But it works pretty straightforward, which is you effectively do a linear search across all the keys in a given node, like 10 and 40 here, okay? 
to figure out which child you want to go to. Then, like we did in all our other binary trees, you move down to the child node and then you do the same process again. In this case, it would be a linear search to figure out which child you want to continue to uh, traverse down to to look at. Now, how do we insert nodes into this thing? All right. So let's say I want to insert a, a node whose key is 12 into the tree we just saw up here, right? So here, where does 12 go? It's greater than or equal to 10, less than 40. It needs to go down here. Uh, is it less than 11? No. Is it greater than or equal to 11 and less than 14? Yes. It needs to go in this leaf as drawn here. And I have a little assumption written down below here. Let's assume that our order five tree can contain up to three elements in each of its leaf nodes. All right. Just because it's order five does not mean you're going to store five elements in, in each of the leaves. They have nothing to do with each other. You could store a hundred in here for that matter. Right. Again, it all depends on how big they are physically and how many can fit in a disc block and what you want, how you want to optimize the situation. Okay. Point is you need to know this number. In this case, we've declared it as three. Why do you need to know the number? Because you need to know if there's enough room in this leaf node to hold the thing. And as it was before, it only had an 11 and a 13 in there. We want to insert a 12, so we can stick it in this leaf node. And that's a very simple insertion. We don't have to change any of the keys up here because the notion of what range of key values are in this leaf down here still maintain greater than or equal to 11 and less than 14. Okay, so that's the easy case. Which is, as I state here, if there's room in a leaf for the new node, then just put it in the leaf and you're done. Okay, now what if it's not the easy case? All right, what do we got down here? Let's suppose we want to add another node whose key is 15. All right, to what we were looking at up here. So let's say we want to add a 15 to this. Where would it go? All right, what do we do? Is it less than 10? No. Greater than or equal to 10, less than 40? Yes. Is it less than 11? No. Greater than or equal to 11 and less than 14? No. Greater than 14? And there's nothing to compare it over here. So yes, it is greater than 14. It needs to go inside here. And as we said before, if the Leaves can only hold three elements each. Now we have an interesting problem to solve here, right? Now what are we going to do? Well, what we need to do is split this leaf into two leaves. Now we're lucky in this scenario because this node up here, the parent of this leaf, has extra unused child pointers up here. So this is, we'll say, one step more complicated than simply like putting 12 in and adding it to the elements in an existing leaf node, okay? We're going to overflow this leaf, so what we need to do is split the leaf in half. We're trying to add a 15 to this one here, so what are we going to end up? We've got a 14, a 15, a 16, and a 19. So what we'll do is we'll take the 14 and the 15 and put that in a leaf. And then we'll take the 16 and the 19 and put that in a different leaf. And that new leaf that's created to hold the 16 and the 19 will link to right up here in the parent node. And when we do that, we'll have to set this key here, right? So we end up with something that looks like this. So here's the 14 and the 15, right? So how do we really make that happen? Well, we took the 16 and the 19 here. We moved it over into its own new leaf, linked it into the parent, and set this key to the smallest key in this child leaf. And then in that reclaimed space, we put the new element number 15 over here. Now, obviously, if the whole tree starts to fill up, this problem will ripple itself up into the tree, right? If all these had three and three and three and three, and all these were filled, and I put another element in here, we would have to do something more than just create a new leaf, right? We would have to split this node here into two nodes, go up to the parent of that one, which in this case it's the root, and add another child pointer up there and have the thing grow that way, okay? 
So this notion of splitting and adding pointers into the parents' nodes recursively, which I've spelled wrong, I'll correct it before I post this, I'm sorry. Uh, this recursively will ripple all the way up into the root, okay? If we ever get to the root and the root is full and it needs to be split into, this is why we have the special rule for the two children of the root node, by the way. If you ever need to split this root because it's got all of its child pointers full and you've just done an insert, what you do then is you just create a new element for a new root. You're going to increase the height of your tree when you do that, by the way. Okay, But if it's full, that's what you do. So you're going to create this new node to represent your root. You take the old root and you take half of the keys and the child pointers and put them into another new node. The new root will have two children, and the rest of the tree will hang off of those two uh, child nodes, okay? So that's how, as you overfill these things, and you start splitting them in half, splitting it in half, splitting it in half, if you ever split the current root in half, because you keep inserting, you're going to add another uh, level to your tree, okay? So don't let this make you think that these trees only have these two levels right here, and they grow horizontally forever. No, that's not true. They'll grow horizontally until all of these nodes have all the child pointers filled in, and all of the leaf elements are full. Yeah, it'll do that. However, once that's exceeded, you then will ultimately run into the case where the, the root will have to be split into two. Then you will have added a new level to your tree, okay? So how then does a deletion work, okay? Well, you literally do the opposite thing that you did when you were inserting. So what then happens when we want to delete a node when the key is zero, right? Well, this is the picture after the fact. Let's go back up here, all right? So if we're starting with this tree here, we want to delete element whose key is zero over there. What do we got to do, okay? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to delete this. That means that this element here will disappear. You don't just put a null pointer in there. What you need to do is remove this key by sliding the pointers and keys that are over here to the left. And when you do that, you end up removing the key here and setting this pointer to null here, right? So you just move everything over to the left. You'll still have the same three children nodes down here. They'll just point it, be pointed to by the first three links, okay? And the last two will then become the null ones, right? So that's why you end up with a tree that looks like this one down here, right? So you'll notice the zero went away, and we moved the three that existed over to the left, and then nulled out the key and the child pointers up here. The same thing would happen if you wanted to delete the node down here, whose key is 10. You'd have to delete the key here and move everything in this thing to the left, and you'd end up with a, a, a null key and a null pointer here, while the three children are the first three of this node. And in that scenario, because you deleted the one furthest to the left, and it's not the first child of the parent up here, this key here might need to change, depending on the way you optimize your database. It probably needs to change to an 11, reflecting the smallest key down here. And I say probably because, again, this is all due to the kind of optimizations that your particular application might require. And my point is, you could leave it at 10, and start this at 11 here, provided that 10 never shows up over there, okay? I mean, it might be more difficult to be loose in how you manage these keys up here than it would be to take the time when you do delete the 10 in this particular scenario to reach up here and change the key here to match the absolute smallest key that is, in fact, down here in these elements down there. So in this scenario, when we del deleted the key that equaled zero, it was a relatively low impact. It only affected this one node over here, all right? But what if we decide to delete keys three and four? Then what happens? Well, if we remove this leaf node here, move this one over to the left, 
then this node here only has two children. It's not a root, and m equals 5, therefore, this node has too few children in it at that point. So one thing you could do is look at the siblings of these leaves over here, right? Maybe I could just steal the 6 out of here and move it over to here. And change this key then to 6, and this key then would change to 7. It would still have three children down here, and everything would be happy, right? That's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to actually eliminate this leaf node entirely, move this one over to the left, and then steal the 10 from this sibling of the parent, okay? All right, again, this all depends on how you want to optimize your database. You have another option as well. 10 only has one element in it, all right? You could reconsider the whole tree. What if you remove the 3 and the 4, and you put the 6 over here with the 2? And that would leave you with a 7 and an 8 that you could then combine with the 10. And then you could eliminate this child here as well as that child over there. Then you could take these two children nodes, the 1, 2, 6, and the 7, 8, 10, and delete this whole parent and move the whole of it over to here. Okay, you'd end up with a tree that looks like this. And you might argue, argue that what you've done there is you're optimizing the space requirements of the database. If your goal is to use as little space as possible to hold your database, this might be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. All right, notice we even had to modify the, the root of the tree up here, right? The root now only has two children. Before, it had three, okay? So we've disrupted the whole tree in order to make this happen. But we've maintained the rules. Now, if we think about this a little bit further, you know, what's the value of conserving space here, right? Well, it might be that the nature of your database is that you fill it up with a lot of data, and then over the course of time, all you ever do is delete things out of it. Well, if that's the nature of your application, coalescing the space so that you keep the maximum number of elements in these leaf nodes at all times is a pretty reasonable strategy, okay? But if the nature of your application is that sometimes you delete a few elements, then later on you're going to go back and insert some, and the thing is relatively dynamic but somewhat balanced in that, you know, you overall keep the same rough total number of elements in your database over the course of time, but you're deleting some and then adding others, right? Well, then the idea of stealing the number 10 over here and just moving it over to this node is probably actually not a bad idea. Because if you do this and you coalesce these nodes, you know, and make this one single node out of what used to be two over here, look what's going to happen. If I was to insert, what, uh, a 17 and an 18, this would now be maxed out. If I then inserted a 20, I'd have to split this one back up and make it just like it was before. And then I'd have to change the pointers and the root and all the keys up here as well. Now, it was pretty expensive, if you think about it, to coalesce the space down this far. And if these things are going to be kept at a pretty high density, and I know that I'm going to be inserting soon, this might not be a very wise move, okay? You may want to do it the other way. And you end up with something that looks like this. Remember, we deleted the element that came be the, with the 3 and the 4, and it that used to be between the 1, 2, and the 6, 7, 8. This also ultimately maintains the rules, okay? And what did we do? We stole 10. We stole the leaf that had a 10 in it that used to be a child of this node here. And we just moved it over here. Now, why is that better? Well, it turns out... It keeps a little bit of empty space in this tree so that future insertions are likely to take place without having to split one of these interior nodes into two to make room for it. 
like I said up here. This one's looking pretty full right here. A couple of insertions, you're going to have to just split it into anyway. So why go from two down to one only to go back to two again? I mean, all those operations, it takes a lot of time to do that. Again, remember, this was designed to try and minimize the amount of disk activity when you're storing it, these nodes on the disk. All right. So if you do a split or a join, you're paying a major tax in time to make that happen. So sometimes you may want to just go ahead and leave a little bit of empty space all over the tree. We're wasting disk space, but we're saving time. All right. So I hope this sheds a little bit of light on what a bee tree is and why they exist and how they work. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.